Uh, my name is Richard Hype. Uh, I, I'm an artist and I'm having this retrospective exhibition here at the Polk Museum of Art, which will cover about 40 years of, of work that I've made. Um, I've been a professor at the University of Florida, uh, teaching painting for the last 37 years. So this exhibition uh, originally started with some correspondence I had with Adam Justice uh, when he was still the curator at, at the Polk Museum. Uh, so um, we had corresponding and Adam had been fi following my work. Uh, so uh, Adam had suggested that uh, he and Claire, the director of the museum, come up and make a studio visit. So uh, I had just been... Uh, uh, had a year research leave from my position at the university teaching painting. So I had been really actively working in the studio making a whole new body of work in the year. Uh, so they came up to see that and saw a number of my other works and been following the work and then they suggested how if I've had a retrospective before and uh, I said no I've had some s some smaller groups of work shown in museums but not a full retrospective and they said well let's let's do it and then once we really started talking about uh, the kind of span of the show and I started looking at what was available, uh, it was really kind of made sense to kind of follow the whole arc of my artistic career. Uh, the exhibition actually starts with uh, some of the first painting that I would think that I would kind of consider, um, you know, kind of work that uh, uh, had any substance to it and goes all the way up to work uh, just completed a few months ago. Uh, and so that will be in the show. I think it's, it's just a real important kind of milestone in my career to have my work recognized like this, certainly by the Polk Museum. Uh, important for me to kind of look back at 40 years of my work and see the see that it's really kind of come full circle, that there's certain things that I have been consistent throughout my work for 40 years of, of work to it. Um, you know, I think what else uh, I think is interesting to look at through that consistency in it are what, what kind of has, has held my interest in that, in that 40 years. Uh, and one of the most consistent things is that I've been doing paintings and doing artwork of other people's artwork or aspects of other, people, uh, other people's artwork, but also looking at other people's artwork as it's been, and through my reinterpretation of it, how it's actually been affected by the system of display that includes the museum. Uh, particularly looking at artifacts or looking at other things and the, again, issues of perception of how the museum actually plays a role in how we think about art and how the work is displayed and how we see it. And, you know, a lot of times I think you can take, you can take almost anything, dress it up and hang it on the wall of the museum and it can become art, right? Uh, you can take an African artifact that was never intended to be in a situation like that, put it in a vitrine and it becomes this kind of special thing to it. So, um, particularly in the last several years, my work is a lot about, you know, the, the kind of system of display and how the system of display affects both looking at my work but also looking at artwork in general. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's kind of hard to make a, a statement of covering 40 years worth of work except I think uh, the statement would be that I think I'm a, a a kind of compassionate, uh, passionate uh, image maker. I love making objects. I love the kind of kind of craft of of making objects, but also that uh, uh, you know I think I'm a, also a very intellectual uh, uh, maker as well too. That the 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 excuse for the work is the idea. Okay, the the work uh, itself doesn't exist really without the idea. Um, the, I think the, you know, for a work of art really to have, to have its, what you might call its life cycle, it requires the public to see it. 
You know, it's kind of like if the, the, the adage, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's he there to hear the sound, doesn't make a sound, okay? Does a work of art mean anything uh, if nobody's there to see it? So it always means something to me, and so I hope it means something to the people that, that see it, so the people will, will ask questions about the work. Why, why is the work made the way that it's done? So that notion of how we see, uh, and again, throughout the years of the work, through examining certain things about vision and vision maladies, making an assumption we all see things the same way, but we don't, you know, uh, that uh, how a vision condition like dyslexia or strabismus affects the way we see, and making analogies to culture in the same way, like do we all see through the same filter, right? That system, we all look at things very differently. So part of the things that I do in my work deals with kind of perception. Again, how do you perceive what you see and issues of, uh, uh, again, what you think you know maybe isn't always what's there. Well, one of the things I've always kind of been good at is uh, in, in terms of drawing that I did or artwork that I did or things that I've done was, was mimicking things, being able to make things look like I wanted them to look. To look. Uh, so I've always drawn, I always was, was, uh, uh, had, a, had an ability to kind of draw things. But a kind of uh, a real seminal moment for me was seeing an exhibition uh, in, the, uh, in the early 70s of a photorealist show, a show of big photograph based, photographically based paintings. I'd never seen anything like that. I was a real kind of naive college student at the time and I said, that's what I'm going to do. And I literally went home and stretched up a big canvas and started a big painting, and that's what I've been doing ever since. I've been very interested in, in again, that kind of goes along with this kind of notion of looking and seeing with uh, the theory of semiotics, of how symbols and signs, we read those things. And so in my kind of exploration of looking at art, I've been frequently kind of layering lots of different kinds of symbols and lots of different kinds of things with art, either in front of it or behind it. Part of that reminds us, or I hope that kind of reminds us that we're always looking at things through some kind of system. Uh, so it can be a system of symbols, it can be a system of signs, it can be a system of, of the way images are described in a dictionary to images that can become uh, uh, um, um, illusionistic images to it. So um, I use a CNC vinyl cutter, which is a computer controlled vinyl cutter to cut out all these different symbols. Sometimes the symbols and uh, symbols and images are things that I've drawn. Sometimes they're scanned from encyclopedias. Sometimes they're scanned from dictionaries. Sometimes they're scanned of things off the web. And um, so I use this uh, really a kind of cornucopia of all kinds of different symbols to uh, contextualize some of the work. Uh, so again, on some of the things you'll see, uh, there might be a, a saint that has a symbol layered over it, which is an entry or an exit sign. Uh, and it's a kind of classical saint. And thinking about, okay, do you use that as a way to get in and out? And then the notion of the meaning of the saint, you have to know what the meaning of the saint is for it to have meaning, or it's just the guy, right? The same thing with the symbol. You have to know the language of that symbol to read the symbol, or it's just an arrow with a square to it. So again, it's about that kind of reading and looking into it. So. Um, you know, I've been interested in, there, there are several pieces you'll see in the show that have a bunch of appliques behind the artwork. And that kind of ex, uh, is meant to reference that there's just this constant uh, uh, flurry of things happening around us that infect the way that we see. Whether they're going to be, in one case, they're images of lenses. And they're all different ways lenses affect the way we see. Uh, and so that relates to the artwork. In another case, there are images of crystals. 
uh, again, kind of thinking about the kind of mysticism that kind of surrounds, surrounds that, kind of layered with the kind of mysticism of illusion. And uh, so I decided it would be fun in the, in the lobby just to kind of blast this, uh, all these different cornucopia of symbols that I've used throughout my career just all in one space. And so again, it's going to be looking out into the world looking through all this kind of system of symbols. And there'll be everything in there from faces to skeletons to anatomical diagrams to semiographic things. Well, this, the, the issue of the, the difference between looking and seeing and uh, um, is, is really at the heart of, of my work. Um, so a couple of different ways I can talk about that. Um, I, I think initially when you look at my work, you assume it's a photograph and you assume it's just a, a kind of me mechanical reproduction. Um, and then either upon you look closer, you read the label, you know something about it, then you realize, oh, it's actually uh, a very meticulously handcrafted object. Um, and what I'm really interested in is then how that changes the way you see the work. Uh, see the work, both literally see it, but then see it in terms of the kind of emotional response you have, the thinking about why would somebody do this when it can happen you know, in an instant with a camera to be able to do it. And then thinking, yes, yeah, somebody actually, the artist, me, actually had to make the decision for every single little tiny mark on there to make it. So they, you know, they look very much like photographs, and I try very hard to kind of mimic that photographic language, but sometimes, somehow they become different. They become softer. You know, in a way they're kind of like, they're, they're, they're more loved. Uh, because they're made in that in that way through the kind of decision process um, that uh, I, th I think kind of changes the way you feel about them. And so, you know, that's a lot of what we try to do as artists. You know, I think we try to make people think and we try to make people feel. And, um, you know, I like to, to use a, a kind of an analogy that if you imagine in the in the 17th century, um, people might have seen a uh, hundred images in their entire lifetime. Okay, we didn't have, we didn't have books uh, the same way. We didn't have billboards, we didn't have TV. And so just think about what the power of a painting must have been in the 17th century. Today, we can see that many images in an hour. Okay, so in a way, I think that's kind of just like a kind of sense of visual overload that there's a, an equalization or a kind of, of, of everything that just becomes visual stuff to it. And I think it takes a different kind of sense of, of again, seeing rather than just looking to really appreciate and understand art. Uh, uh, in just the recent issue of Art America, the critic and painter Stephen Westfall actually has an article about slow painting. And he talks about how there's a number of painters that work in what he calls slow painting, which is a slow kind of sustained process of painting that takes a long time to make, that his contention is that it takes then a longer time to actually look at them. And it's really sometimes about the, the looking at the difference between a picture and a painting uh, and the difference that exists between those, something that is, that is handmade and crafted and a result of touch rather than just the capture of a photograph. The term photocentric is a term that I coined a number of years ago to talk about my painting and photocentric as opposed to photorealist. Um, I was never happy with the term photorealist because it suggests that if the photograph is a kind of surrogate for realism and the photograph is a photograph, it's a monocular vision of things. And uh, so my work was more also about the language of photography and the role of photography and how photography affects the way we see. So that's where the centric nature comes from, that it's really about the language of photography more than just photography as being a, a capturing image-oriented thing. Um, 
this, this most recent body of work uh, is called uh, Reflecting on Boys. And it's, it's based on photographs that I took at the Dia Museum of Art uh, in Beacon, New York, uh, of performance photographs by the really well-known German artist Joseph Beuys. Uh, Joseph Beuys was a, a very influential artist and teacher, uh, particularly in the Fluxus movement. So Joseph Beuys was one of the first artists to really present performance and the performance of the kind of uh, mythic presence of himself as part of, as part of his artwork. Uh, so Joseph Beuys would do these public performances where in one case he locked himself in a gallery with a coyote, in another case he would do these other kind of public performances. And so I think that these pieces I've tried to kind of to get a kind of sense of the kind of mystery that Boys has that's reflected in the reflections of this work. So the, the Dia Museum has this large collection of these Joseph Boys um, photographs and they're installed and were only installed for a very short period of time. They're actually not on display anymore. Um, so there's a kind of mystery behind Boys that Boys was, uh, I'm first generation uh, uh, American from German uh, ancestry. Boys was a German artist. Uh, my father uh, actually fought in the German army. Joseph Boys was also in the German army. And the myth behind Boys that he's constructed was that he was uh, uh, he was shot down and uh, uh, had to survive uh, in the wilderness with uh, using felt to keep warm and fat as well. And so a lot of his performances involve this fat and this and this felt. Uh, so. There's a, I think there's a kind of mystery in this space where you can't really get a sense of what really is in the, in the space or not the space. So you have a kind of an illusionist uh, notion of a photographic space, which is a picture of space. So you're looking into a kind of deep space. And then reflected in this glass, in the glass on top of the photograph, is the space of the Dia Museum. And the Dia Museum has this other kind of space that's reflected in the glass. And then there's actually a third level of space, which is the, actually the surface of the photograph, where I've painted little things that happen on the surface of the photograph. And then all of this is kind of, each image is kind of revered, revealed through a silhouette of myself. So the, really the only way you can see Joseph Boys in this situation is if I'm in front of it, so that you can actually see Boys. So it's not just kind of reflecting on boys, the literal reflecting, but kind of reflecting on who boys was, how he was as, as an artist, and how important he was in the role that he played, both as an as important artist and as well as a very influential teacher. You know, my, my background is I... Uh, uh, grew up as a, a child of European immigrants uh, who were both factory workers. My parents were both factory workers in a really non kind of academic environment. Uh, actually, never thought I'd never thought I'd go to college. Uh, never certainly never thought I'd be a professor. Uh, always as a as a child drew all the time. Um, and interestingly enough, I found out since when I became an adult, some of that had to do with my ability to always be able to draw. It had to do with the visual condition that I have. A strismatic condition that causes me to see the world flatter than most people do. So it's easier to draw. Uh, so I always had that thing, thinking I would be a cartoonist because I would just draw the Sunday funnies all the time growing up. Um, had no interest in school growing up. Uh, you know, went to a vocational high school, didn't even go to a college prep high school. Wanted to be, uh, played in rock bands, and wanted to be a rock star at the time uh, to it. The draft was on. Um, School was a better option. Going to college was a better option than the draft. Started going to school. I was in an architectural drafting program in high school. Um, then came across a very gifted teacher at a community college who recognized that I had, uh, you know, what you might say talent as drawing. And then I found out, well, you could actually do that. You can actually kind of be an artist. And then, uh, then really uh, opened up a whole world to me, both in terms of academics of what you could learn and what you could say and that kind of put me on a path to uh, kind of being an artist and I've just been uh, um, you know I love making art I love looking at art I love taking students to museums and I think uh, 
I love museums, and so it's a great honor to have my work uh, shown in a, uh, a museum as prestigious as the Polk Museum.